when Mark said, okay, so we have this thing called the Burntwood Lecture, and it's, it's sort of an opportunity to say some things that you might not manage to get off your chest during the course of a normal year. And I thought, hmm, end of December. It's been quite a long year, quite a momentous year in many respects. And I decided to take Mark um, up on his invitation, hence this deliberately provocative title around uh, the growth fetish and the death of environmentalism. Um, that will resonate with different people in different ways, but it doesn't matter. I hope by the end of my talk you'll see more or less what I'm trying to do this evening. So, I want to start, if I may, by just making a short comment about one of my closest friends in the Green Movement, a man called David Fleming, who died two weeks ago, uh, tragically, in uh, Amsterdam. Um, he, for me, was one of the formative influences in my life. We co-authored the Green Party Manifesto in 1979, so this goes back a very long way. And he was one of those rare people who succeeded in teaching me quite a lot about economics without making me feel completely inadequate. Um, I'll come and mention the other one a little bit later this evening. His book, The Lean Economy, has been in authorship for the last 25 years and sadly still hasn't seen the light of day. But a lot of what I'm going to say goes back to David's basic analysis that we all know we're living in a completely busted system, but we're not at all certain that we know what to do about that and how to dig ourselves out of it. And I'm just, I hope you will indulge me in allowing me to give this lecture tonight um, in memory to a certain extent of David. This is the backdrop. We all know what's been going on for the last 50, 60 years. It doesn't matter if you can't read these little bits at the bottom, explanations of what all those things are. It doesn't really matter. Every single trend you care to mention for the last 50, 60 years has been doing something like that. Huge amounts of accelerated growth on a global basis, affecting the lives of increasingly large numbers of people year by year. So whether it's use of fertilizer or water consumption or this one here is McDonald's restaurants. I only mention that because it's quite sort of interesting. It doesn't really matter. There's been this great surge in economic activity that has, of course, improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people today. And there are very few people, even now in the world today, who would really want to call a stop to that. Because on what basis would you call a stop to it? If it is deemed to have been beneficial to the lives of very large numbers of people so far, on what moral basis do you say that no one else any longer has the right to improve their lives in the same way that we have for the last 50 or 60 years? Well, rather bizarrely, it seemed to require the intervention of Nicolas Sarkozy to convene a group of very eminent economists from around the world, including Amartya Sen and Nick Stern and Joseph Stiglitz and so on, to create for him, as French president, a report on alternative or additional ways of managing and measuring progress in society. Interestingly, having talked to one or two people who were there at the launch of the report, President Sarkozy went completely off piste at the launch. And instead of talking to the main thrust of the report, which is fantastically dry and dusty, as you can probably imagine, decided to deliver himself of this absolute diatribe against what he called GDP fetishism. <coughs> the idea that not only are we somehow subservient to the automatic supremacy of economic growth, GDP, in all our lives, but actually we've done something very interesting and very dangerous. We've stopped looking at it rationally on the basis of the empirical data available to us, and we have turned it into something which now cannot really be questioned from a rational and empirical base, because it has a higher status. It overarches any notion of the empirical base available to us. Now, this phrase has resonated with me for a very long time, and I must say many of you here, I imagine, this evening will be familiar with some of the old growth debate now going back a very long way. So when we talk about growth, we still struggle a little, a little bit in terms of definitions about what kind of growth are we talking about. And I'm grateful to my colleague Paul Eakins, a co-founder of Forum with myself and Sarah Parkin, that we spent quite a lot of time working out how we wanted to talk about growth. And this is basically Paul's idea that you can come up with much more sophisticated ways of generating economic growth than we choose to do today. You can take it through a kind of hierarchy 
of increasing sophistication. So I call this up here dumb growth, and I call this smart growth. Now, for reasons really which are very difficult to plumb the depths of today, we're still pretty wedded to the dumbest versions of economic growth available to us. We haven't even evolved into some of these ideas about economic growth, which have been available to us right from the early 1970s onwards. We haven't actually decided to make economic growth as good as it could be. And economic growth as good as it could be would be a damn sight better than economic growth as we have it today. Bafflingly, it has been very difficult to detect a sustained pattern of intervention by the environmental NGOs, both the radical ones and the mainstream ones and the very conservative ones, very difficult to detect a pattern of intervention to start challenging why it is that politicians have failed even to take us through this hierarchy. Why we haven't actually understood that there is a difference between this kind of growth that just accelerates the demise of everything we hold dear in life today, and this kind of growth which would make a big difference and possibly give us some answers to the questions we face today. Why is that? And why have the environmental NGOs and the development NGOs and the human rights NGOs been so utterly inadequate in addressing that challenge? That question sits with me very problematically today, especially in the aftermath of Cancun. Well, we all know the reason in crude terms. We've sort of had a huge increase in the numbers of human beings. We've had this great acceleration. We love this idea that our plug, our demand on nature can go on getting bigger and bigger every year because that's what progress means today. More people demanding more of, guess what? A set of resources, services, which don't actually increase at all in material terms every year. Most politicians the world over are still completely wedded to this model of human progress. More people demanding more of a planet that is finding it increasingly difficult to provide more for more people every year, as we all know. The unmentionables, of course, and I realize I'm treading here on controversial territory, especially in a room that includes large numbers of conventional environmental uh, adherents. One of the principal reasons behind this is, of course, the huge population growth that we've seen over the last 100 years or seen over the last 50 years, and that growth is still ongoing. Still very difficult to raise this, still very difficult to get into a proper debate about it. There was a little piece in The Guardian today by Peter Preston, erstwhile editor of The Guardian, saying, why is it that the one word that it would have been helpful to add to the constipated deliberations of Cancun never got uttered, that word being, of course, population. Why is that word still completely taboo at international gatherings of that kind? And are we really so utterly oblivious to the desirability of trying to do this sustainability story with fewer rather than more people that we just sit back in our lives of environmentalists and let this story unfold? So, when I did an article three years ago for Greenpeace Business Newsletter, and I sought to point out to the readers of that newsletter, and indeed to all members of Greenpeace, that there was quite a significant difference between trying to deliver a sustainable, low-carbon economy for 9 billion people and trying to deliver a sustainable, low-carbon economy for 8.25 billion people, which is where we could quite easily stabilize human population, by the way, without any great acts of daring do or political bravery, not a complicated story to get to 8.25 billion quite quickly as it happens. The consternation on the part of Greenpeace was, well, what does it really matter? Why are you bothered about the difference between 9 billion and 8.25 billion? In the great span of all these things that we're talking about today, how can that possibly be material when we look at what has to happen from a sustainability point of view? Well, I'm sure all of you will have done the sums already. So that's the difference, 750 million people. I ask you now to project your thoughts forward to 2050. Imagine a world in which we have seen 
significant progress in addressing the Millennium Development Goals, increasing the material well-being of large numbers of people around the world. But we've also seen some energy efficiency creep in here, some decarbonization of a sort of gentle kind. So speculate that by 2050 we may have got in those developing and emerging countries to an average per capita emission level of four tons per person per annum. It is blindingly bloody obvious that in 2050, 750 million people will still be adding an additional one, three billion tons per annum. Now, I'm bound to ask, when I look at the massive difficulties we face here in the UK, as the Climate Change Committee, the Committee on Climate Change, invites us to accept increasingly difficult targets for 2030, for 2050, amounting to some millions of tons of CO2, which we all feel is absolutely the thing we should be rooting for, and every self-respecting environmentalist in the UK will be out there backing the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change to save a few million tons of CO2, yet they are in of giving voice to even the most gentle opinions, suggesting that population might have a role to play in this. So that's charge number one. And now I want to move on, as it were, to open up an even more complex territory, which is why have the environmentalists marooned themselves in an area of relative marginality, relative irrelevance, when it comes to addressing the problems we face today. Here, so here's my summary, very quick summary, of where the standard prescription for dealing with the world's crunching sustainability issues are today. These are the big three, decoupling, I'll explain that in a moment. Innovation, we're all excited by that, and so we need to be, and marketization. I'll have a little brief bit to say about each of those in a moment. We're doing a lot down here now on behavior change and nudging, this is the big word. I had to put it on a slide somewhere tonight. <laughs> Otherwise, you would all have dismissed me as an ideological throwback with no understanding of the current agenda, so we're into lots of nudging now, which is great, and I welcome it. In fact, the deck now has six full-time people thinking about nudging. It's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing as we nudge our way towards the apocalypse. And we're all, of course, <laughs> these days, really pretty focused on the notion of well-being and happiness as a bit of an alternative, substitute, complementary, additional, part and parcel of pursuing conventional GDP. David Cameron is actually quite seriously persuaded that we need to have an economy in which the concepts of well-being thrive rather more than they do today. But do not assume that it is in any way offered to an electorate as an out-and-out -out substitute. It is at best an addition to it rather than a substitute for it. So I'm really not going to talk about this very much because <laughs> politicians really don't do that and I'm not sure that environmentalists really understand it much either. So I'm going to focus a little bit on these three, decoupling, innovation and marketization. Okay, so I am now unapologetically plagiarizing the wonderful work of Tim Jackson, who I shared many a happy year with on the Sustainable Development Commission as we sought to browbeat the Treasury into understanding that there really were one or two issues about its devoted adherence to the concept of decoupling. Tim is in the audience tonight, so I'm even more constrained by doing those, this, this in front of the person from whom I've plagiarized it, but that does happen sometimes in life. 